Coming up on Episode 6 of Omnivore, a look at Center Store supermarket trends, attacking salmonella in poultry, and artificial intelligence in food product development. All that and more, this is Omnivore. From the editors of Food Technology Magazine and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by IFT First Annual Event and Expo. Join science of food professionals from around the world, July 16th through the 19th in Chicago. Learn more at iftevent.org. Welcome to Omnivore from IFT and Food Technology, where we explore the intersection of business, science, and technology in the global food system. I'm Bill McDowell. Those many months of COVID-19 restrictions created boom times for U.S. supermarket sales. But as the pandemic waned and inflation surged, the picture has changed. Unit sales for most center store product categories have declined. And with more economic instability on the horizon, it's critically important for product development initiatives to be well-focused and strategically executed. In this segment, trends guru and food technology contributing editor Liz Sloan offers her take on center store survival strategies in a conversation with the magazine's executive editor, Mary Ellen Kuhn. Liz, I'd like to have you start by talking a little bit about center store sales. Has inflation officially ended the sales boom that many grocery product categories enjoyed during the pandemic? Yes, Mary Ellen, I think it has. Inflation has stayed very high during the fourth quarter of uh, 2022, and it's about 15% for the center store. And as a result, the pandemic sales boom has really kind of gone bust. Um, and it's really confusing. If you look at center store dollar sales figures, that's what's inflated by these high prices. You get the impression that sales are soaring. So if you look at the real number, it looks like sales are up about 8%. But if you look at unit sales, which is really what's most important, because that's the actual number of products sold, only two center store products, frozen cookies and energy beverages, have enjoyed double-digit growth. In fact, out of there's 130 categories they track in, in the center store, only 10 had positive unit growth. And if you're curious to what they are, they're kind of interesting. Powdered milk, pastry and donuts, bagels, Asian food, rice cakes, candy, baby formula, and nut butters has done extremely well. So looking ahead for 2023, center store unit sales are still projected to remain flat. So that's the number of products sold. And they can project, they're projected to fall as much as maybe 3%. So the misery, unfortunately, isn't over. And with two thirds of shoppers saying they're trying to buy only what they need, product developers have to be very careful or very strategic as they develop products going for the, forward for the next year. Thanks, Liz. I think the only surprise there to me was rice cakes. Liz, I'm hoping you can take us through the three center store success strategies you identify in your February food tech article. The first one involves developing products that help consumers create experiential meal occasions. Well, what does that mean for product developers and retailers? Well, I think that foods and beverages that can provide a culinary advantage or a very special treat can help break the price barrier. And it's perfect timing because if we look at what uh, the annual survey of the National Restaurants Association of the leading chefs around the United States, we find that the number one culinary trend for 2023 is going to be exper experiential food. So we're right on target. And I think there's a couple of ways that we can go about this. First of all, global cuisines. At this point, more than half of younger adults and actually more than a third of boomers now eat ethnic foods other than the big three. So Italian, Chinese, and Mexican every week. So it's about time that we began to focus on some of these other cuisines. And the most consumed after the big three are Japanese, Greek, Thai, Latin, and Middle Eastern. And at the same time, fusion cuisines, where we're marrying two very different flavors, one familiar, and one perhaps a little more exotic, 
are now on 40% of restaurant menus. So that's another little option that we can use. Do it yourself. We all know it's fun, right? But we can better customize what we actually want to prepare. And it's more affordable in a lot of instances. So things like wonton wraps and egg roll wraps and liquid flavor enhancers are some of the shining stars, if there really are any at this point, in the center store. Another thing that's really important is snacks or snack sales are really driving center store sales just by their sheer volume. They're huge. And one of the most important things right now is as we cut back on restaurants and restaurants cut back on their hours, especially their late hours, what's happening is the late evening snack or after dinner snacks from restaurants are going home. And that's a really big opportunity. It's a 16% of all restaurant sales. And it's something that we should really go for. Healthy snacks, uh, plant-based snacks and jerky, zero sugar candy, that sounds impossible to me, and high protein cookies are the fastest growing healthy snacks opportunity. Well, in your article, you also discuss the idea of ultra convenience. Why is that so important to consumers and how should CPG companies be delivering on that? Great question. It's always been important, as we know, but I think two things are going on. First of all, with everybody back at work in school, the time crunch is worse than ever. I think we all know that. And as a matter of fact, right now, still, as of November, 78% of all meals are still being prepared at home. That's almost as high as during the pandemic. So the market is clearly there and it's a big opportunity for us. And it's it's gone so far that some of the marketers like Ajinomoto with their Taipei frozen line are actually putting the amount of time that it's necessary to prepare the product right on the front and nutrition stickers as well, flags as well. I think we have to keep in mind who spends the most on food. And number one is household with, with teens. We better figure out how to feed them, number one, at an affordable uh, level and find some things that are going to really interest these younger kids. And so something that's simple, you know, simmering sauces, starter kits, soups, pasta, rice, all of these things, shelf stable meals are not only affordable, but need to be kicked up to, to kind of keep with the, with the trends of the younger folks. You've coined a term that I really like, high performance health. Tell us what that involves and how companies should be capitalizing on that. Sure. I think it's the next generation of functional or super healthy foods that we're starting to see. And, and that's basically foods and beverages that take a more aggressive approach. So, for example, they might add more ingredients than you would expect, more synergistic ingredients, and they go after more than one health benefit. So they're multi-benefit based. We're seeing some other new things that are fascinating to me, Mary Ellen, in this whole area. And that's the role of parents or the interest of parents in health. You know, over the years, a lot of the children's supplements products haven't sold that well. But I think times are really changing. Uh, health Focus has some great new research out. They're more proactive about learning about health. They're more active in trying new foods for themselves and for their children that are health-based. And they're willing to pay more than the average consumer for health. So I think in a way, they're a bit of a missed market. I think just in general, uh, the, the trend to buying healthier is continuing and, and it may be even accelerating. Uh, data from IRI shows that the purchasing of foods with vitamins and minerals is up 217% over last year. Weight loss is back in vogue is the number one benefit they're looking for. Weight loss market sales are up almost 10%. And you see a lot of the increase in advertising as well. Another big switch in dieting is, I wonder what took this so long, but heart healthy diets have risen to the top of all eating plans and diets that consumers are on, followed by low carb. Uh, what else is, is, is really come back very strong is gluten free. Uh, which got pretty quiet there for a while. One in five adults say they are always or usually trying to avoid gluten. So it's being interpreted in different ways by different people, but it's something that we should definitely keep an eye on. 
And lastly, I think we've all heard and read about uh, some of the issues now going along, going on with plant-based, the side of the market, particularly with the alternative meats and fish and, and chicken, et cetera. And there's some, some really good data to see that all this controversy has begun to cause an erosion in the diehard side of the, the real supporters. And so people that have avoided um, uh, poultry and fish and eggs and some of these things, animal products for a long time. And the number of people who now believe because of the execution of plant-based in, in, within the food industry, uh, that truly believe the products are healthier at first glance is down to 50%. And the people who believe that they are, and there's brand new data from Health Focus, they believe that they are good for sustainability and planetary health has is even fewer. So it's far, it's, it's far less. So it's time to really pay attention there on what we're doing and what we're delivering and what we're communicating. Well, thank you so much, Liz. We can always count on you for the latest information on trends, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Liz Sloan is president and CEO of Sloan Trends and a food technology contributing editor. She's been keeping her clients and other industry watchers informed about the latest consumer attitudes and purchasing behaviors for over 30 years. Learn more about what's happening in the center store and how CPG companies are responding by reading her article in the February issue of Food Technology. The global stevia market is expected to grow 9.6% by 2029, according to a new report that says that category sectors such as beverages, dairy, confectionery, and bakery are poised to shift their ingredients towards stevia extracts. Stevia is a natural zero calorie sweetener and sugar substitute whose active compounds are 50 to 300 times sweeter than table sugar, as well as being both heat and pH stable. Food Technology Associate Editor Emily Little discusses where the stevia market is growing the most and possible changes in the market. I'm Emily Little, Associate Editor with Food Technology Magazine, and here's this episode's news story. The global stevia market is expected to grow nearly 10% from 2022 to 2029, according to a new report from researchandmarkets.com. Stevia is a natural zero-calorie sweetener and sugar substitute. You've probably heard about it being used in sodas. Its active compounds are 50 to 300 times sweeter than table sugar, and it is both heat and pH stable. According to research and markets, stevia-based products are considered superior in terms of sweetness, texture, mouthfeel, crystallization, flavor, and shelf life. At the end of 2021, the global stevia market reached $780 million and is expected to grow to $1.6 billion by the end of 2029. That is a major jump. Last year, dry stevia composed of most of the market share with 82% compared with liquid stevia. And the Asia Pacific region is predicted to bring most of the market growth because China is the world's largest producer of stevia. So they're going to maintain most of the market share since that's where most of this plant is actually being grown. Now, research in markets hypothesizes that stevia will become more popular among consumers because of growing health concerns around sugar consumption. There's a growing health food culture among consumers, particularly in Asia, where we're going to see the largest market growth. So there's an increasing number of new products with stevia extracts that are going to drive that growth. This report estimates that more than 5,000 food and beverage products worldwide currently use stevia as an ingredient, and that number is only expected to go up. However, this market is going to have some difficulties. The report mentions that there is a major fluctuation in the price of stevia leaf right now, and with inflation, that could affect the market growth. So while manufacturers may want to use stevia in their products, they may not be able to afford to get it and will have to go back to using sugar as their main sweetener. The main applications of stevia still include beverages, dairy, confectionery, 
and bakery. And those categories are only expected to expand in the next few years. So as this plant-based and label-friendly sweetener grows in popularity, more and more manufacturers are incorporating it into their products to meet sugar and calorie reduction goals. So they can make their products taste just as sweet, but maybe make it a bit healthier for the person eating it. That's all for me for this time, and I'll talk to you soon. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment. But first, this word from our sponsor. Did you know that FIRST stands for Food Improved by Research, Science, and Technology? Well, now you do. At IFT FIRST, attendees will experience innovation in action, research, scientific discoveries, and connect with peers new and old. The theme of this year's IFT FIRST is innovation in a time of crisis. Can we future-proof the food system? Registration opens March 1st. Exhibitors are locking in space now. Don't miss out. Go to iftevent.org to learn more. Welcome back to Omnivore. I'm Bill McDowell. In 2020, the law firm Marlar Clark LLP petitioned USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service on behalf of individuals and consumer advocacy groups to declare 31 Salmonella serotypes as adulterants under the Federal Meat Inspection Act and the Poultry Products Inspection Act. Of the 2,400 known Salmonella serotypes, these 31 have been associated with human illness outbreaks and product recalls. The petition has sparked renewed conversation among scientists and regulators about whether classifying salmonella and adulterant would actually drive down salmonellosis illnesses, just as declaring E. coli 0157H7 an adulterant in ground beef did in 1994. Food Technologies Science and Technology Editor Julie Larson Brisher met up with University of Wisconsin-Madison professor Stephen Rickey to get more insight into the challenges of codifying salmonella as an adulterant in poultry. Well, it's so great to catch up with you today and talk a bit more about why declaring salmonella as an adulterant in poultry and meat products presents the scientific and regulatory communities with a few eeks. Now, you co-authored a timely article published in Food Control in 2020 with colleagues from the University of Arkansas on the public health impact of salmonella species on raw poultry. And in that review paper, you talk about how industry efforts to lower the incidence of salmonella have been successful but that the number of illnesses from contaminated poultry has not seen an associated drop. So why aren't we seeing the number of salmonellosis cases drop if we are effectively reducing the pathogen during production and processing steps? Well, I think it points to several things. Number one is is that poultry isn't the only game in town in terms of being a source of salmonella, and this data probably supports that pretty strongly, actually, if we think about it. You know, and we know from previous outbreaks and things that leafy greens, other meat products, uh, uh, almonds and, or, or nuts and all kinds of stuff can be sourced to salmonella. I mean, salmonella is a pretty ubiquitous organism. And, you know, and it, it all ties into, you know, the preparation of the food. If it's eaten, you know, some foods are not processed, you know, like certain uh, leafy greens are eaten as is, for example, you know, and so you, there are susceptibilities that are all over the board in terms of risk, et cetera. And so, you know, I think, you know, I think poultry's done a good job of trying to get a better and better handle on controlling salmonella and certainly are continuing to work very hard on it. That alone, I don't think necessarily sol- completely solves the salmonellosis problem. I think there's a lot of other sources out there that are non-poultry that should get probably equal attention and equal efforts in terms of trying to control it and introduce interventions, et cetera. And, you know, and I think at the end of the day, I think a consumer needs to be aware of these risks as well is, is that, you know, salmonella is, is, you know, everywhere. I mean, you know, it can be in water even for uh, under the right circumstances. So I I think it's, it's a little bit simplistic to point out a particular food group and say, yep, that's going to solve the problem because it's not going to. Entirely. I mean, it, I mean, it's going to, everything helps, don't get me wrong, but I think other measures need to be taken as well. 
Well, what what did you and your co-authors conclude are the opportunities for improvement in assessing or or mitigating the presence of salmonella in the processing plant? Yeah, I think there's a multitude of things there. I think one of the things that jumps out, and we pointed it out quite a bit in there, and I think and technology is moving in that direction to be able to more uh, precisely quantitate salmonella loads. Uh, that all ties into risk. I mean, the lower the numbers of salmonella on a carcass or on a meat product, the lower the risk potentially, depending on what servar it is. And so any ways that we can do a better job of quantitating total loads of salmonella and getting an idea of what the, how those loads are responding to interventions, I think would give us really some good data to be able to evaluate how effective we are in terms of controlling salmonella. The other thing is, is real-time quantitation. In other words, Part of the problem is, is we, have, we we still probably have to wait too long for results. And what we really obviously need is something that gives us almost an instantaneous readout. Uh, you know, like right, right away, we know what the salmonella load is. And so steps could be even taken in real time, potentially, if that if it's an issue. We're probably a ways away from that from a technology standpoint. But I do think that, you know, and I think I mentioned in there having real-time sensors that would actually, you know, tell you how much salmonella is there or other pathogens for that matter would be a real game changer, I think, in terms of the industry. I think better identification of the serovars themselves, not all salmonella of serovars cause disease. I mean, some serovars are more pathogenic than others. Some are not really pathogenic at all to humans. And so being able to differentiate those serovars and determine which ones are true public health risk would be also a game changer and also economically would be helpful too because, you know, there's over 2,500 serovars of salmonella. Is it realistic to be in a position to be able to work with all of them? Not necessarily. There's probably, a, you know, a, a small portion of those are the ones that we really need to worry about. And so our quantitation, detection, and, and other means need to be pretty much geared on those. And then the thing I would add to that is, is that we probably need to get a better handle on the physiological status of salmonella when it's present. In other words, how virulent is it? Uh, there are ways to do pathogenesis assessment. We can measure that genetically. And so I think what would be really useful is to say, okay, we have salmonella there. First of all, is it live or dead? Because some techniques can't distinguish between the two. And obviously, all we care about is live salmonella, number one. And number two, okay, the live salmonella, are they really pathogenic? And therefore, you have a pretty low infectious dose and a really big risk. Or are they, are they more minimally pathogenic and maybe the risk is less? And so being able to model that risk or predict that risk, I think, would be hugely helpful in terms of downstream knowing what we're up against in terms of interventions, etc. We probably need better indicator organisms, that is non-salmonella organisms that parallel or behave like salmonella but are non-pathogenic and are, are much more higher quantities, more frequent, et cetera, to where we could use those responses of those indicator organisms to tell us how salmonella is going to respond to interventions if we apply them because we're not always going to find salmonella. In fact, it may be relatively infrequent. And so so we can't really evaluate interventions all the time in terms of against salmonella itself. Sometimes we need to look at overall bacterial loads or individual indicator organisms and see how they respond and use that as a way to say, yeah, okay, this indicator organism is getting decreased. If salmonella were there, so would it get decreased in a similar fashion. And finally, I would say, you, you know, we just need to continue to interpret the data, continue to gather the data, and continue to increase our database to get an idea of what we're up against. I mean, I think, you know, we, we still jump off and do a lot of assumptions on certain things. And I think we really need to be careful about that to some extent. And I think more and more data and more longitudinal tracking from live bird all the way to, car to carcass and processing would be helpful to get an idea of the ecology of salmonella, you know, and why we see certain incidences of it, et cetera, and, and can we predict those and can we devise management schemes to help minimize those uh, those uh, um, uh, outcroppings of salmonella. And so I think, and that's just a smorgasbord of a few things. I think there's a lot of other things that could be done too. And bottom line is, is we, we just need a lot more science, I think, to really get a handle on what we're up against. Well, and you know, your that the paper that you wrote um, it was published in 2020. This the same year that Bill Marler filed the FSIS petition asking that 31 salmonella serotypes be declared adulterants. Do you think this reclassification is problematic from a scientific perspective? 
Well, given what I just talked about in terms of detection and quantitation and all the other, you know, all the other steps that we still have to work on, I do think it's a little bit jumping ahead of the game. I mean, because it's it's not saying that we can't do things as an adulterant, but the real question is, is at the end of the day, is that necessarily going to com- totally solve the problem? Salmonella, as I mentioned a little bit in the review article, is a somewhat of an evolving organism. I mean, it you know, cerevars come in and out. Some become more virulent than others, et cetera. And so, you know, are we going to get ourselves trapped into, okay, these these X number of salmonella are adulterants, and so we go along happily, got those under control, and all of a sudden a new cerevar pops up. And we're completely blindsided because we haven't do, been doing the things I just talked about, you know, monitoring salmonella, looking at cerevars, developing those baselines and developing those databases to where we can anticipate, okay, we've knocked this cerevar out, but then we created the niche for a new cerevar to come in. And so, you know, it's, again, I think we want to be careful about that because I think everybody wants closure on these kind of issues. And I would argue that that's a difficult thing to achieve. And so I, I think you're better off having, you know, better monitoring tools you know, better risk assessment tools, et cetera, to where you can really get a handle on what Salmonella is doing. And then I think going with that, we really need to bore down on source attribution. We need to understand, okay, exactly what is poultry con- contributing to Salmonellosis in general, and what are the other players out there in terms of sources? Because again, I think at the end of the day, maybe we declare victory with the adulterant thing, but then Salmonella, what do we do if Salmonellosis still doesn't go down? Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thanks, Steve, for taking the time to talk with us today about poultry, salmonella, and science. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm hoping to get back over to UW Madison to have me some of that beef jerky at Bucky's Varsity Meat. Say, say hi to Mitch for me. What a great we'll, shop we'll you guys do. have. <laughs> okay. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye bye, Julie. Stephen Rickey is professor and director of the Meat Science and Animal Biologics program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where his research focuses on foodborne pathogen ecology from farm to processing plant. Check out what Stephen and other experts had to say about declaring salmonella an adulterant in the February issue of Food Technology. Consumer science researchers are always looking for new tools to better understand and anticipate consumer preferences, particularly for new food products. Saraksha Rajagopal, head of research for the market intelligence firm Spoonshot, says artificial intelligence might offer the missing ingredient for product developers. I recently spoke with Saraksha about the promise of AI insights, as well as perceived shortcomings of conventional methods. Suraksha, thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Happy to be here. In your recent essay, you say that relying exclusively on traditional consumer science methods like panels and surveys might be giving food companies an inaccurate or at least an incomplete picture of what consumers want. Explain what you mean by that. What kinds of insights are we missing? Consumer panels are uh, generally small because of the nature of the research the, and the cost involved in hiring panelists. Uh, they generally have to be small. So they usually about 100 to 200 panelists, and th- that's already a very small population. Also, usually during this research, they have to they kind of screen out panelists because, you know, if you're going to get 200 panelists, you might as well get the right kind of consumers. And so, yeah, so it tends, ends up being biased because of that. So if you're doing sugar-free research, you're going to get people who are interested in, you know, buying sugar-free products, which doesn't necessarily give you, you know, how big is the demand for sugar-free, right? So um, that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, consumer panel panels or surveys can give you an incomplete picture. So explain a little bit more about how artificial intelligence specifically can inform a more complete picture. Sure. The biggest advantage with artificial intelligence, big data, is that it's more data, right? So if you can do 10,000, if you go into thousands of um, panelists, you can do billions of you know data with AI or 
uh, with you know tapping into social media or tapping into consumer reviews um it's and it's also more organic data right you're not asking a question and getting an answer for that uh, you're you're just you're seeing organically what what the consumer wants like are they talking about sugar free are they are they not do they do they uh, without even me asking are they saying that they like the product and that therefore tells you know tells you the demand organically right in the essay you cite one example of a product misfire in in the low sugar chocolate segment mm-hmm. talk a little bit about that what 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 were the signals that they missed what were what you know how how would having these additional inputs have potentially helped with that product rollout there's multitude of reasons why products fail and uh it's hard to know without you know doing a proper investigation but in this case nestle had rolled out uh, a low sugar chocolate and it, it it didn't do very well like yeah and nestle is a big company so you know you would think that the, you know there's a lot of work that goes into um, before rolling out a product it could have been that they um didn't capture the demand of the market well. So potentially it's possible that people don't want, uh, you know, low sugar chocolate. Chocolate, you know, is one of those indulgent categories where people, you know, maybe want to keep the sugar in it, but want to have less of it, right? So we've seen that the negative sentiment towards uh, sugar and chocolate you know, is kind of positive, right? There's not there's not that much of a negative sentiment towards sugar and chocolate together, as opposed to, you know, something like sugar and beverage. So our data indicates that you know, maybe people want sh- sugar out of their beverages, but not out of their chocolates, because, you know, it's an indulgent premium thing. You know, once in a while having um, a, ch- a, sh- a chocolate, which has the normal amount of sugar in it, is okay. So... If this more detailed and, and nuanced insight is is out there in these tools, are there any real or perceived barriers to change in the discipline? In other words, why why isn't everybody doing this? Yeah, again, food is is a complicated beast, right? It is it is part science and part art. It's not you can't like ask a product developer. Yeah, there it's it's not um it's hard to translate all of that knowledge in a product developer's mind into like a machine the industry is used to like this conventional market research maybe a little too used to it um and they've kind of been slow and like more focused on like you know uh the issues with ai right no technology is perfect the first time when it comes out um but i think you know as an industry, uh, I think, uh, you know, you have to see the value and like kind of work with work with um, technology companies to kind of evolve this together. Because I think that, uh, you know, people who work on this and like try to invest some time in it, you know, work on making it better as opposed to, you know, just like, you know, dismissing it because of its issues i think that those kind of companies will not you know the companies that work on it put the time invest work through the glitches will be an advantage it's just a matter of time right it's not it's not a matter of if these technologies will take off and that's going to be the norm i believe that in a few years ai is just going to be the norm Saraksha Rashagopal is head of research for Spoonshot, an analytics consulting firm serving the food and beverage industry. You can read her full essay in the February issue of Food Technology. Thank you to this episode's sponsor, IFT First Annual Event and Expo. Registration opens March 1st, but you can preview the content and companies who will be at the event by going to ifteventorg And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org membership. 
For more in-depth discussion about innovation and the science of food, check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of IFT.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at IFT.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening, and join us again for our next episode. This is Omnivore.